If you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, for a better experience, switch to the video version. The link is in the top right corner of the video and in the episode description. Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're looking at the further assessment and management of hyponatremia. I have looked at the guidelines produced by North Bristol NHS Trust and Royal United Hospitals Bath NHS Trust, as well as other guidance focusing what is relevant in primary care only. The links to the sources consulted are in the episode description. If you have not already done so, I recommend that you listen to the previous episode on hyponatremia, its classification, clinical presentation, pathophysiology and causes, which will give you a good introduction to the subject. Right, without further ado, let's get started. Let's have a look at the management of hyponatremia. As we know, acute or severe hyponatremia can be a medical emergency and we should admit for hospital treatment anyone with either symptoms or severe hyponatremia, understood to be a sodium below 125. People with asymptomatic mild hyponatremia, that is a sodium of between 130 and 135, can be investigated and initially managed in primary care. But what do we do with people who are asymptomatic and who have moderate hyponatremia, that is a sodium of between 125 and 129? Well, these people need careful assessment because there may be a risk of the sodium falling quickly. So, in these cases, we should seek specialist advice in respect of admission or referral. Let's now look at the management in primary care. And, as a precaution, all patients with new onset hyponatremia should have a repeat sodium checked after one week to exclude a rapidly decreasing level. We should then assess the volume status to see if there is fluid overload or hypovolemia. We will look at a useful flow chart later, which will give us more information in that respect. We should then review the medication and, if it could be the cause, if possible, we will stop it and repeat the sodium levels in one or two weeks. If the sodium level remains low after stopping the medication, we should seek specialist advice. Of course, if the medication cannot be stopped, then we will discuss with the prescribing consultant. We should also look for and investigate disorders that may cause hyponatremia. We will look for symptoms of possible intercurrent illnesses that could play a part, such as chest infections, gastrointestinal disease or UTIs. We will ask about fluid intake and nocturnal polyuria that could point towards primary polydipsia. We will inquire about possible cancer symptoms especially lung and gastrointestinal, and arrange a chest X-ray and additional investigations if necessary. This is because these malignancies, particularly small cell lung cancer and pancreatic and colorectal cancers, are known to produce antidiuretic hormone. We will consider further blood tests, such as renal function tests, including NGFR and urinalysis, to exclude renal disease liver function tests to exclude liver disease, thyroid function tests to exclude hypothyroidism, 9 a.m. serum cortisol if Addison's disease is suspected, BNP if heart failure is suspected, total serum protein and serum electrophoresis as well as urine men's junk protein if myeloma is suspected, and finally, a paired serum osmolality and urine osmolality and sodium. It is essential that both the serum and urine are sent on the same day. Let's see what these investigations mean. Serum osmolality will determine whether the hyponatremia is pseudohyponatremia when the serum osmolality is normal, hypertonic, like in hyperglycemia, when the serum osmolality is high, and hypotonic, like in true hyponatremia, when the serum osmolality is low. In this case, we will have to look at the urine results to assess further. Urine osmolality will determine how concentrated the urine is. If the urine is very diluted, 
and urinous molality is below 100, then ADH is not acting, like seen in primary polydipsia or high beer intake or potomania. If the urinous molality is greater than 100, then ADH is acting, and we will have to look at urinary sodium to categorize it further. Urinary sodium will determine whether sodium is being appropriately regulated in the kidneys. So, if urine osmolality is above 100, and if urinary sodium is low, that is below 30, then the kidneys are reabsorbing sodium correctly. If the patient is hypovolemic, we will look at extra renal losses of sodium, like, for example, in excessive vomiting, diarrhea, sweating or extensive burns. If the patient is hypervolemic, we will consider conditions like, for example, heart failure, liver disease or nephrotic syndrome. If both urine osmolality and urinary sodium are high, then it means that the kidneys are not reabsorbing sodium appropriately. Like, for example, in Addison's disease, salt wasting diseases and syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH. But the issue becomes more complicated depending on whether the patient is on diuretics or has CKD, so these patients are best referred for further specialist assessment. And we should normally refer any patient in which we suspect cancer, primary polydipsia, an endocrinology cause, or suspected syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. So, let's try and make sense to all this by looking at this flowchart by Royal United Hospital Spath. So, when we find hyponatremia, we will review the fluid status and medication and consider pseudo-hyponatremia and other possible confounding factors such as hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia and paraproteinemia. If the patient is hypovolemic, we will expect to find the typical clinical signs such as postural hypotension, tachycardia, dry mucous membranes, a decreased skin turgor, sunken eyes and erased urea. And if the urinary sodium is low, that is below 30, we will consider extra renal loss like, for example, diarrhea and vomiting, burns, bowel obstruction or pancreatitis. However, if the urinary sodium is high, that is above 30, we will consider renal loss, like for example diuretics, acute kidney injury, renal disease, Addison's, congenital adrenal hyperplasia and cerebral salt wasting disease, in which case admission and specialist treatment may be required. If the patient is hypervolemic, like in edematous disorders, we will consider conditions like, for example, congestive cardiac failure, ascites, liver failure, nephrotic syndrome and low albumin states. In which case, we will treat the underlying condition, which is also likely to require specialist referral. If the patient is euvolemic, we will carry out investigations such as thyroid function tests and non-AM serum cortisol, as well as pair serum osmolality and urine osmolality and sodium. If the thyroid function tests are abnormal or the 9-AM serum cortisol is low, we will consider hypothyroidism or Addison's disease. And we will refer them urgently to endocrinology as the treatment is disease-specific. On the other hand, if serum osmolality is low, urine osmolality is high, and the urinary sodium is also high, with normal cortisol and thyroid function tests, and without contributing drugs such as diuretics, we will think of syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. But by then, we will have concluded that referral for specialist assessment and management is needed. So that is it, a review of the further assessment and management of hyponatremia relevant to primary care. We have come to the end of this episode. 
remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for listening and goodbye.